Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. How are child soldiers who are forced to fight against their own will in very dangerous areas of the world having their human and civil rights violated? What is UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, and other organizations doing to help these children? We'll be back in just a moment to talk about these and other hot button issues. Welcome back to our program. Today we're focusing on the plight of child soldiers. Child soldiers do not get a lot of attention in, in many of the media outlets today, yet over 250,000 of them are serving in many very dangerous areas of the world. So today we're going to talk about child soldiers and what it means to be one. My guest in 1991 was involved in a, a vicious civil war that overtook Sierra Leone. Ishmael Bea, at the age of 13, was forced to become a child soldier in this conflict. Later, Mr. Bea came to the United States and attended the United Nations International School. After high school, he enrolled at Oberlin College and graduated in 2004 with a degree in political science. Ishmael Bea chronicled an intriguing account of his experiences in a book titled A Long Way Gone, Memoirs of a Child Soldier, of a Boy Soldier. Ishmael, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Thank you. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's talk, we're going to get into it in great detail, but let's just talk very generally about what is a child soldier? What are sort of the age range that a child would be involved in, and what, what does a child soldier do? Well, the, the general age um, is that children could be as young as 9 to under 18. That's what's considered a child soldier um, uh, in age-wise. But the general perception has been a child, a boy with a gun um, who fights directly in a war. But that idea has been broadened to, to, to cover children who are used as uh, cannon fodders, children who are used to carry loads, those who are cooked, sexually abused. So it's covered a lot of areas now, and that's what is considered as a child soldier. Mm -hmm. Now, it used to be primarily boys, but girls are getting involved in this also. Girls have always been involved. What has happened is that the images that we've seen have mostly been boys. And it's mostly boys that have been spoken about, but there are also girls who fight directly as combatants and in addition to the sexual abuse that they receive from some of the, 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 the male figures they're fighting with. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to get into this in great detail in just a moment, but let's go back prior to the Civil War and talk about Sierra Leone. I'm sure a lot of our viewers are familiar with Sierra Leone. Some may not be quite as familiar, but let's talk a little bit about, I guess it's fair to say that prior to the Civil War, you had a situation where Sierra Leone was a regular, sort of a normal country. You had regular development taking place, an emerging middle class. You had educational institutions, infrastructure such as roads and schools and things like that. But talk a little bit about Sierra Leone. Where is it located? What is the population? How large is it more or less? And just a general overview of it. Um, well, Sierra Leone is, is a country that's located in West Africa and uh, it borders um, Liberia and uh, Guinea. And um, uh, it is a country that had about five to six million people roughly uh, before the war. Um, and um, as you mentioned, there were a lot of developments. It was a very peaceful country. I went to school as a young boy there. Um, you know, but the political climate began to change, which led to the war, uh, actually. So, uh, prior to all of that, it was a pretty peaceful country, and most people had never heard about it actually until the war. Mm -hmm. and that's very, very true. It certainly it, it was not on the radar screen for most people. That's very true. What prompted the country to go to war? Who were some of the key players? What were some of the major issues? Why, why did a civil war develop? Well, we had a political party that was called the APC, All People's Congress, that had been in power for a number of years, and they had pretty much changed the constitution to say that there was a one-party system and the sole legal political party was the APC. So there was no election after that. And because of that, they began to embezzle funds, 
They began to tamper on people's rights. They began to do all kinds of things that changed the country tremendously uh, and made people desperate and wanted his government out of power. So a fellow called uh, Fudi Sanko, uh, who was a corporal in the army, broke up from the army and actually started what was called the RUF, the Revolutionary United Front. Uh, now, this, when this organization started, it had a political and, um, and um, a military branch and an ideological, ide ideological branch and everything. But when the war was launched, it was only the military side of it that was active. So the ideology behind it was lost very quickly, and it became a war that was just bloody and senseless, and it became a way just to stay alive for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that information, along with a lot more information, is included in a really excellent book that you wrote. It's a national bestseller. It probably is an international bestseller now. It's a long way gone, Memoirs of a Boy's Soldier. And this was one that you wrote, I guess, about three or four years ago. Or three years ago. Three years ago, <laughs> right. And I just noticed the other day it was back on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. Well, That's really <laughs> quite commendable. But this is an excellent book. It's very interesting. It's exciting. And it's, it's one that will keep the, the reader's attention without a doubt. But let's talk a little bit about you and personally. How did you get involved in this particular civil war? With whom did you fight? Did you join because you wanted to or because you had to? Uh, I, I joined because I had no other choice. Um, it was either that or being killed, you know. Uh, the country got to a point where as a young boy, anyone who was younger, uh, you became compromised in the sense that uh, being forced to fight became a way to actually live, if you will, uh, to buy more time to be alive. Um, I lost my immediate family in the war. My mother, father, and two brothers were killed in the war. I became the only survivor. Uh, along with you know hundreds of other children who had similar uh, stories, I ended up going to a military base, a Sierra Leone military base, uh, as a group that I had broken out from the Central Command, and um, I looked for safety there, for food, for shelter. But this turned into a situation where I was I could either fight or had to leave. Now living was as good as being dead because once you've looked for safety amongst one group, when you leave, the other group will shoot you because children also use as spies. So. I had no choice, and um, I was forced into fighting, was trained very briefly, and my life changed uh, from a kid who was running from the war to now fighting. Mm -hmm. Now, these, the children, a lot of the children have turned in their arms. They're, they have decided that it, they no longer want to fight. They want to try to get away from it. I mentioned earlier about UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, uh, focusing on trying to help children to get out of this very dangerous situation. Of course, people can go to www.unicef.org and learn more about what's going on with this and many other issues. But what uh, was the incentive for children to turn in their arms, uh, to give up fighting? Uh, because so many of them had been brainwashed. They were using drugs and things like that, as you indicated in your excellent book. But what, uh, what incentive did they have to try to get out, and what incentive did each side have to release these children? Well, what, what happened in my case, particularly I was removed from UNICEF. Uh, it varies, and sometimes when wars ends, when peace negotiations are put in place, different, the both sides of the fighting, or if there's more than two sides of the fighting, they will be asked to, um, part of their, their, their commitment is to release children so that they will be put in rehabilitation centers. It really comes down to, uh, there are some children who escape on their own because they can't take it anymore, but it really comes down to the commanders and the people involved in it, whether from the government side or from the rebel side, knowing that if they work with international organizations, that when it comes to trial, they will receive certain amnesties because of their cooperation. So they remove these children. For some young people, the incentive is that you're tired of fighting. This has been the only option that you knew, and now you've been given another option, so you take it. Uh, for example, when I was running from the war, if I knew another option existed, I would have taken the other one instead of fighting. But the only option was to fight, and that's what I did. So it's just having another option. Some kids are given, in the case of Liberia, some kids were given $100 as a way to start up. You're given rehabilitation. You're given vocational training, some schooling, and things like that. So you're given a chance to regain your life again. Mm -hmm. I mentioned earlier about drugs and amphetamines and different things like that. What role does that play in keeping the child soldier, the boy soldier, girl soldier involved with a particular side? Ah, the drugs play a very uh, st a strong role. Um, there are other things, of course, in terms of coercion, you know, and things of that sort. But the drugs play a very strong role because one of the things you're introduced to violence and you're uh, pushed to accept the violence and understand it as your reality at that point. 
So in order for you to cope with all of the violence that you see and you participate in, you are given the drugs as a way to numb certain feelings, as a way to uh, make sure that you don't have the ability to exercise certain emotions because if you do, you may not function as a, as a soldier. So that's what the drugs plays. For example, in my case, we had what was called brown brown, which is a combination of cocaine and gunpowder, heroin and gunpowder with a little bit. And when you took that, you didn't even feel your own body. You didn't feel for yourself. You felt invisible. You felt that you could do anything. And of course, you go in, in front of, in, in, in certain cases, you go f in, in, in front of gunfire that if you're in your right mind, you would not. So these are some of the things, you know. Um, that the drugs does for some of these mm -hmm. young people. Most assuredly. And do you, it, I would imagine it's very difficult to get off of them, is it not? Yes. Post-war, after you've been removed, it's one of the most difficult things is to withdraw from the drugs and learn to live without the violence. But when the drugs is no longer in you, then you're left with the nightmares, with the flashbacks. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn to face them and deal with them. And that's why rehabilitation is absolutely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, this would be true, I think, for boy soldiers, girl soldiers, or even perhaps for regular soldiers and regular armies, that so often they find it more difficult to come back to a civilian setting than it is to stay in that particular military setting, maybe where you're being shot at every day or you're, it's a very dangerous situation. Did you find that it was more difficult to return to civilian life as opposed to staying in the military or absolutely. staying with the army? Absolutely. It was um, at some point being in a war, you've gotten accustomed. You know, you know how to react. Your reaction rate is you've been accustomed to that reality. When you come back to normal life, what is called normal life, it becomes very difficult. Uh, and it, it, is, it is one of the most difficult things I had to do. First of all, you don't only have to relearn how to function as a human being again. You have to have people trust in that humanity again. So in my case, that was a double thing. Where you're coming, everyone thinks, oh, this is a former child soldier. He's capable of only violence. Where you're trying to change. You're withdrawing from the drugs. It is very difficult. It is possible, but it is a long-term process. Mm -hmm. Now, you were talking about the, the two basic sides. The government on one side, you were fighting with the government troops, and then you had the rebels on the other side. Yes. How large armies are we talking about, and what percentage were child soldiers? I know it's difficult to get a handle on the exact numbers, but uh, do you have a, a ballpark idea of how large each side uh, had, and how many of them were child soldiers working for each side? Um, I, I would say most of the groups had a lot of child soldiers. If you had, uh, like, a squad, you would maybe, if a, you have a squad of 100 people, you maybe would have 20 strong adults and the rest would be children. And some of the adults had actually been children because the war went on for 10 years and they've grown to be adults and they took command in certain areas. So you're really talking about an, uh, sort of an exodus of children that start when they're younger and then become, you know, the guys, uh, you know, commanding the place. So you had a lot of children. And also because the way this was a fourth uh, is that, you have more children. You have the, in a place like Sierra Leone, the huge population is the larger part of the population. So everyone used them. The Kamajoj, which is another group, the RUF and the army. And um, because they're children, they don't ask for pay. They don't, we don't have helmets. We didn't have bulletproof vests. We had no shoes on sometimes. You can't have adults fight in a war like that. So you use children because you can coerce them. You can convince them uh, to do some of these things. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, and the main purpose of Global Connections is to focus attention on international issues that impact people from Frankfurt, Kentucky to Frankfurt, Germany, and from Lima, Ohio to Lima, Peru. Welcome back to our program. Today we're focusing attention on child soldiers, and my guest is someone who is very knowledgeable of a, what a child soldier is and does because he was one. In 1991, a vicious civil war overtook Sierra Leone. Ishmael Bea, at the age of 13, was forced to become a child soldier in this conflict. He came to the United States, he got a high school degree, went on to get a, a bachelor's degree in political science, and he also wrote a really a fascinating book on his experiences as a boy soldier, A Long Way Gone, Memoirs of a Boy Soldier. Ishmael, we're talking about the situation in Sierra Leone and how you were, against your free will, abducted and taken into the army. We're talking about how the, the rebel group and the government battled each other. What is the situation today? I know when I think back to it, the United Nations peacekeepers came in, they helped 
separate the warring sides. They helped bring stability. They had problems at first, but it finally prevailed. What is the current situation in Sierra Leone? Well, the war in Sierra Leone officially ended in 2002. And since then, there have been several measures taken for developments to rebuild places that were destroyed um, to boost up the morale of the people again. So the country no longer has a war. It is a very safe place. Actually, I feel safer there than I do in certain neighborhoods in New York, in my opinion. <laughs> but um, but um, there are still difficulties, which is that a lot of people, particularly the youth population, still needs education, uh, needs to be involved in something that uh, you know shows that their life is worthy. And um, you know, some families need, still need to find ways to feed their children. There's still poverty. Some of the things that led to the war, like political corruption, still exist. But um, it is not an easy task to uh, rebuild a country after a 10-year civil war, after a lot of neighbors who have learned to hate each other and things have changed. So uh, we're working at it, but uh, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, it seems promising. Mm -hmm. And of course, you're building upon your past experiences and on your resolve to help people in the future. And you're now working with UNICEF, not as an employee, but you're working as a UNICEF advocate for children affected by war. I think that's the first position ever created to, with that title. What I may have the title wrong, but if I do, correct me. But what do you do as this advocate? Uh, well, what I do is that, you know, um, I draw on my experience as somebody who had been on the receiving side of some of the benefits that the United Nations, UNICEF and its affiliates offer to children. Uh, I speak on behalf of children at the Security Council level, at the General Assembly level. Even uh, I go to Washington, D.C. and various countries to talk to leaders to make sure they prioritize the issues of children, particularly when it comes to conflict, and uh, providing assistance for them to prevent them from entering conflict and to help them after they have returned from conflict. So I do that, but I also travel in my capacity as a UNICEF advocate to some of these places where these things have happened to speak to the young people, to have them understand that it is possible to have a life after this, using myself as an example that there were times in my life where I didn't feel it was possible for me to do anything besides be in a war. So I played that kind of dual role because I feel that it is also important um, uh, to have that realistic voice you know, as part of the discussion, as part of determining what happened. And lastly, what I do is that I try to bring young people together with the people who are in charge of making the decision so that they can hear from them. They can directly talk to the people who they're trying to help so they can understand what it is that they need as opposed to what they think they might need, you know, mm -hmm. just as a way to improve this work. You know? Exactly. And you took this one step further. You developed a network of young people affected by war. And I want to make sure I get this right. It's www.nypaw.org. Yes. What is this group and how can people learn more about it? If uh, they go to the website. If they go to the website, it will, it's called NIPAW.org and the, the acronym is Network for Young People Affected by War. And we, I, over traveling around, I met a lot of young people who had been in similar situations that I had been in, affected by war in various capacities. So we all decided that we were all doing work. Some are writers, some are musicians, you know, some are professors who just finished law school. So we had people from Sudan, Bosnia, Uganda, Sierra Leone, and we have some new members now coming in from Colombia. So we decided that why don't we have this network together to showcase uh, the fact that uh, not only to talk about how people go into war, but also the possibilities of coming out of the war, to share some of the success stories and to be a part of the discussion. Uh, so that's what we started this network for, you know, so that we can actually, uh, you know, uh, we are not just passive right holders, but we become active right holders, you know. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important to involve people. And of course, anybody can participate in this, can learn more about it. You don't have to be a boy soldier or a girl soldier, no, but yeah. you can, anyone who has an interest would be encouraged to tap into it. Certainly. certainly yes. yes. Network for young people affected by war. Yes. Yes. Well, now you've done a lot of things, and I'm not sure we'll get to all of them today, but one, you just recently attended a conference in Chad, and of course we know Chad is very close to Darfur, and there have been a lot of, well, Chad's had some problems too. What was this conference about, and what came out of it, it as far as uh, suggestions, recommendations, or uh, more information about this very difficult area? Well, this was a conference that was put on by the Chadian government and UNICEF, um, and it was a conference, a regional conference, to uh, write a declaration that came out called the Jamena Declaration. And this conference involved uh, Chad itself, uh, Sudan, Central African Republic, Niger, uh, Nigeria, Cameroon. 
to talk about how to protect children, you know, because those countries have borders that are very close to each other, and to talk about how you prevent children from going into war, how you rehabilitate children, to learn about what's going on around each other's borders and things of that sort. It was the first time that a lot of people from these countries have sat together in one room, so that in itself was absolutely important to talk about this issue, to find a common ground in which they can work on behalf of children. And so the idea was really to have a more regional uh, initiative that's not you know, as an international one that's very broad, but more focused, and to try and do some things concrete in that area to make sure that children are not uh, abused in any form, whether it's through uh, sexual abuse, through violence, um, or because of war and all of those things, yeah. Mm -hmm. It certainly is. Now, UNICEF, the UN Children's Fund, has been a key player in helping to extricate, extricate children from this very horrific situations. But let's talk a little bit about these children who have been in these horrific situations. As you mentioned, they were taking drugs in most cases. They really didn't think about what they were doing. They were pumped up, and they would get out there in the line of fire and not think about it. They also missed out on their childhood. They really did to a large degree. You did for many years of your life. They missed out on going to school, socializing with their friends, playing games, and that type of thing. But you got into a UNICEF reorientation program. What do these children, just to describe a normal reorientation program, what do, what do you do as far as when you're in this type of program? Well, first of all, you're brought to the place from whichever faction you've been fighting in. And then it's a center basically where you can have food, you can have meals, uh, you can receive some informal education just to try to catch you up again. Uh, there are clinics where you go through psychosocial therapy uh, and things of that sort. You withdraw from the drugs. It becomes a safe haven also. Because in some of the times, like when I was removed from war, in some of these places, the war is still going on while the children are removed. So it becomes a safe zone also to withdraw from the war and try to be a normal child again, to learn how to socialize again, to learn how to live without violence, and all of these things. So, so that, that would be a sort of the setting and what you would experience yes. as someone who was going, uh, undergoing a reorientation program. Yes, absolutely. What was the most difficult? We talked about the drugs. We talked about the fact that you left the war zone, came to a civilian zone. You were viewed differently. What would be the most difficult thing in the average day of someone going through this reorientation? Well, I would speak personally for myself. There are various things, but I think one of the difficult things is, is trying not to remember what it is that you've come from, you know. Um, because you, you come uh, in a lot of ways with uh, uh, a lot on your mind about the violence you've seen um, that transfer into your nightmares, you have flashbacks, you have, you know, all kinds of things are going on with you. It's trying not to think. It's having this mental battle about the trauma that you're now trying to withdraw from. And that's one of the most difficult things. You know, learning how to function again is, is very difficult. Mm, it certainly would be. Do you stay in touch with any of your friends from that era, any of the other children who were in the, in the army with you, or do you have contacts with them? Yes, I do. The ones that uh, survived, um, I stay in touch with them. Some are in Sierra Leone, some are also fortunate to go in other places abroad to study. So I'm in touch with a lot of people, and um, I consider them my, my brothers. I think being in that same situation, seeing the worst of us and the best of us together has is, is brought us closer, you know. Now, do you have any recommendations as to what could be done? I know the United Nations, well, they, the UN Children's Fund has you as an advocate uh, explaining what happened in your particular situation, trying to encourage people to develop policies, governments to develop policies. Uh, one a guest who's been on our show before a couple of times, three times, I think, Radhika Kumaraswamy is the United Nations Spe Special Representative for Children in Armed Conflict. But are there any recommendations as to what can be done to shine the spotlight more on that quarter of a million children who are still trapped in this situation and maybe to lend a hand to help them get out of it? Well, uh, of course, work has been done. And I would say the time that I came out of the war uh, around in 1996, it was very, uh, very little. There was nothing at all, you know. Uh, the Office for Children in Armed Conflict was created since then. Various Security Council resolutions have been put in place, the optional protocol on the various international legal standards in the African Charter for the Welfare of Children, and all of these things have come in place. But there's still more that needs to be done, which is to strengthen the, the mechanisms that are already in place, to hold people responsible for doing this, to support organizations, long-term focus on rehabilitation, so that children post-rehabilitation can go to school, better reintegration processes. But there are also new developments that are happening, which is that 
uh, we find more and more children being uh, dragged into um, a lot of uh, extremist groups right now, which puts us in another different position in how you deal with this. For example, we have the case of Omar Khadr, who was a young Canadian guy who was involved in something in Afghanistan that hurt a U.S. soldier. That's a new development. There's also another thing where how do you rehabilitate children in countries that still have ongoing conflict? You know, how when you they pass rehabilitation center, how do you make sure they don't re-enter a country that still has conflict? So there are all these kinds of challenges that are there, but I think something can be done. It, of course, we need the political will, the international political will, to make sure this doesn't happen. And so we try to talk to governments that don't only have this problem, but those that don't have the problem right now. Because we're talking about the youth of the next generation, which in most countries don't have anything going on in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so if we don't take care of them now, we have the next generation who doesn't have any moral or uh, ethical foundation at all. And they will be more difficult to deal with later on. So this is the time to really do something uh, to prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. Most surely. Now, we're talking about, it, well, certain areas of the world, there's been a reduction. Obviously, Sierra Leone, the, the boy soldiers, girl soldiers are not in that situation today. But there, some other areas of the world are having sort of an uptick, an upsurge in the problem. Somalia is one of them that just has been receiving quite a bit of publicity lately because of the fighting that's going on over there. How difficult is it to uh, to get people in a situation like that where they're basically, it's a sort of a dysfunctional situation. Yeah. The government controls a very small part of Mogadishu. You've got various groups fighting one another. How can you make a difference in that area? How can you get in there to reach not only the, the children, but also the people who are keeping these children in this war zone? Yeah. Well, Somalia is a very difficult situation, you know, in the sense, as you mentioned, access is one of the most important things that UN organizations need in order for them to uh, get access to certain places and of course that comes by governments in inviting them but in a state like Somalia where the government is not in control it becomes very difficult but I think it's not uh, hopeless what is that media attention slowly can garner certain supports and certain uh, push for some of those guys fighting there to sit down and do what's in the best interest of children and I think that is possible that can get done but what I would suggest one of the things that can be done is that a lot of these wars are heightened because of the influx of small arms into these places. If we find ways to prevent small arms going into some of this country, we can reduce the, the violence that can occur, you know. And also, we can also use giving military supports to certain groups as an incentive to uh, collaborate, to work, and do something together for children. So there are various things that can be done in that area. You know? mm -hmm. There certainly are, and we need to focus more attention on these. We do for a little while, and then it seems like the CNN moment is over and the, yes. it drifts off the front page or the, the cameras move away from it, but it's extremely important, and you've certainly chronicled some very interesting experiences, and I think this book would be of great interest to all of our viewers, and it's titled A Long Way Gone, Memoirs of a Boy Soldier, and we encourage folks to take a look at it because it is it's not only informative, it's very inspirational, and people will certainly have a much better feel for this horrific situation after reading it. Well, Ishmael Bea, I want to thank you so very much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us on today's Global Connections program.